Hello, my name is Tom Burbine, and I'm very excited to present this UCLA meteorite lecture uh, for Easter. And my, the talk will be about Vestoids, Vesta, and HEDs. And uh, on my first slide are some of my collaborators, Paul Buchanan, who's an expert in HEDs, Howard IQ, Kreitz, and Diogenites, Mike Jersinovic, who uh, helped me uh, do some electron probing during the pandemic, and Richard Greenwood, who's an oxygen isotope expert. And I I'm going to talk about my work studying the Vestoids, trying to understand their mineralogy, trying to determine how it relates to Vesta, and I'm going to use HEDs, meteorites that fall to Earth, as my guide to analyzing these objects. And I also like to thank the RISE2 uh, uh, grant that I'm on, uh, which is part of the sur survey. The outline of my talk is I'm going to first just give a slight introduction to reflectance spectroscopy. Then I'm going to talk about four Vesta. Then I'm going to talk about the meteorites, Howardite, Eucrites, and the Diogenites. Then I'm going to talk about Vestoids. Then I'm going to talk about these equations I developed a few years ago to determine the average pyroxene mineralogy of an HED from their reflectance spectra after calculating their band centers. I'm going to use the formula on Vestoids to get their uh, bulk pyroxene chemistries. And then I'm going to talk about what the study of these Vestoids tell us about Vesta, and then some conclusions. So reflectance spectroscopy is basically light is reflected from a surface. And uh, for an asteroid, the surface is going to be composed of particles. Some of the light's going to get absorbed. Some of the light is going to get reflected off the surface. We can measure it through the telescope. And different minerals absorb light differently in the visible and near infrared wavelength regions, which is the wavelength region we typically observe on Earth. And from how the asteroid reflects light, you can determine the surface composition of an asteroid. And how you get it, the, the sun is your source. Light is emitted from the sun, is reflected off the asteroid, in this case, Vesta. Then you go and you analyze it at your telescope. For near infrared spectra, you usually do it at the IRTF, which is uh, on Mauna Kea. They have some type of prism or grism, which uh, disperses the spectrum, and you, uh, you measure it on your detector. And you can measure the reflectance over a variety of wavelengths. And then here is a visible spectrum, not a near infrared, but a visible spectrum of Vesta that was taken in 1970 by uh, Tom McCord and his collaborators. And you can see Vesta's reflectance spectrum is actually very similar to a Eucrite, how it reflects light. And this was a huge discovery at the time because Vesta, one of the largest asteroids in the asteroid belt, has a reflectance spectra reflects light like a particular type of meteorite. And Vesta is probably the best case where we can link an asteroid with a, some type of meteorites. All the ones, there's always problems because the spectra are not unique, but the spectrum of Vesta is very unique and it matches very well meteorites on Earth. And this just shows a, a part of the solar system. You have the Sun, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, and then the asteroid belt, where Ceres and both Vesta lie, and then you have Jupiter. And uh, Vesta is the second largest object in the asteroid belt. Ceres is now classified as a dwarf planet, but Vesta is the second largest. It's a very large object, and we think it's a protoplanet, an object that did not get incorporated into another body and made a planet, one of the uh, protoplanets that still reside in our solar system. And this just shows this plot proper semi-major axis, which is the average distance between the uh, object and the sun for these asteroids. And then you have a sign of the proper inclination. The inclination is the uh, inclination to the ecliptic. And you can see there are all these asteroid families all located throughout the uh, asteroid belt. And in the red, 
here is the Vesta family. You can see it's kind of dispersed, but all these objects in this Vesta family have similar orbital elements. A, the E, which is the eccentricity, and I, which is in the inclination. So they, they match up very well in three dimensions. This is only a two-dimensional plot. So there's all these families in the inner asteroid, though, and Vesta's one of the largest. So Vesta, if you observe it through a telescope, is just a dot in the sky. Then if you take the spectrum, you can see some absorption features like an absorption band, this absorption band due to pyroxene. And then you have the Hubble images were taken like 2007. You can see it's kind of fuzzy. You kind of get a glimpse of some of the features. Then the Dawn spacecraft took very up close images of Vesta. It orbited Vesta and you could see how amazing the pictures look of Vesta. And then we also have meteorites on Earth. This is a Eucrite, and you can see. So we actually have pieces of Vesta, and we can tell they're pieces by how they reflect light. And this is done by the numbers, like 100,000 images taken by the spacecraft. It orbited three, over 3,000 orbit of Vesta and also Ceres. All this data was taken. And it was an amazing mission that studied Vesta and also Ceres, which I won't talk about, but it studied Vesta, which is thought to be the parent body of meteorites we have on Earth. And these are pictures of a Howardite, Eucrine, the Diogenite. The Eucrite is composed primarily of iron rich, low calcium pyroxenes, kind of like pigeonite, and also a plagioclase feldspar, about half and half. The Diogenites are primarily orthopyroxene. The Howardites actually have mixtures of eucritic material and also diagenetic material. So there's mixtures showing that the eucrites, the diagenites, and also the Howardites all come from the same parent body. And there's a, lot, there's a few thousand of these HEDs that we have on Earth. But th that's how, they, how we can link them, these meteorites all to the same body. So they usually abbreviate as HEDs, Howardite, Eucrites, and Diogenites. What is thought to happen is you have a body which is chondritic, has a bulk composition relatively close to the sun. It is heated and melts. The metallic iron is heavy, dense. It sinks to the core. The lighter stuff goes to the surface and you get what's called differentiation. So you get some type of crust, some type of basaltic crust, you'll get a mantle and you'll get an iron core. And this is just a cartoon of what Vesta and you have a crust, some type of mantle, and then you have the core and that shows the slice. So, and this body is intact. Most of the other asteroid families we saw at the beginning are believed to be bodies that disrupted all the pieces. But Vesta is kind of unusual. You have a large body and then all these smaller fragments that have similar orbital elements. So Vesta was not disrupted. Vesta is still intact, which is kind of amazing. And this shows some reflectance spectra. This is wavelength on the x-axis and reflectance on the uh, y-axis of some uh, different minerals. You have iron, nickel, metal, the black line, which is relatively flat, pyroxene, which is the red. You have two absorption features called a band one and band two. And then for olivine, which is the green, you have a very asymmetric just band one. And this, the shapes of these uh, absorption features will, will depend on the, uh, uh, the particle size and also the composition. The composition will change where, where the band centers are and also the strengths of the features. So it's very complicated. Up at the upper top, you see where the visible wavelength region lies. So different minerals have different absorption features. Now for pyroxenes, it's complicated because they're a solid solution and there's all these uh, cations that could uh, replace different cations in, these, in the crystal structure. And when you replace one cation with another, it changes the absorption features you see. And so the, you can see it's very complicated, but the ones you really have to worry about are pretty much just the calcium the iron and the magnesium. 
those are the ones that kind of control for the HEDs where the absorption features will lie. And they will look differently, different colors, different crystal structures, depending on the composition of the pyroxenes. And this is what's called the pyroxene quadrilateral. Uh, the three parts of the triangle are magnesium uh, uh, pyroxene, which is ensatite. You have a iron pyroxene, which is ferrocylite. And then up at the top, you have a calcium pyroxene velasinite. Up at the top, you don't find uh, pyroxenes uh, naturally with that much calcium in. So it's pretty much the bottom, which is called the pyroxene quadrilateral. And different pyroxenes uh, have different compositions and different names and different crystal structures depending on their composition. And just to show, this is work by a uh, Duck Middlefeld, uh, the pyroxene quadrilateral and just some examples of how the composition vary for some uh, eucrites. And you can see the compositions do vary. They, they just don't stay in one place. The pyroxenes on the, in these eucrites have a variety of compositions. There'll be some type of average, but it will range in these eucrites. So you, it's a, when you look at a, a eucrite, and when, for me, when I'm measuring the reflectance spectrum, I am, I am looking at the average reflectance spectrum of lots and lots and lots of different type of pyroxenes. So I'm looking what the average composition is, the average bulk pyroxene composition is, because all of these pyroxenes, all their, the way they reflect light, they all superimpose pretty much, you'll see like one band center, a band one center and a band two center. So just, this is just to show that these pyroxenes, there's a range of compositions and everything's very kind of, a little more complicated than you would like. And this just shows what the spec, spectra look like. So blue is a eucrite bubante, red is a howardite EEP, HM503. Uh, green is diogenite, which is uh, Johnstown. You can see even though each of them have variety of pyroxenes, you, you get a, a curve with a band one and a band two you get all these nice shapes and you can see the band centers, the band two centers for the eucrites are at longer wavelengths due to having higher calcium and iron components. The diogenites are at shorter wavelength, the band centers. And that is due to having lower iron and lower calcium. And the howardite's kind of in between because it's a mixture of diogenitic and eucritic material. This also shows some IRTF spectra of uh, 3715 stole and 4 Vesta. And you can see they have very similar shapes. So you can tell that the, the minerals that are uh, causing the reflectance spectrum or uh, controlling the reflectance spectrum are pyroxenes. And you can see that, and this is a very distinctive spectra that you don't find the spectrum where most other asteroids, all the spectra tend to have, that we find like this to have compositions similar to HEDs or VESTA itself. So you can see, so the 3715 stole is what's called a Vestoid, but you can see how similar the structure of the bands are. And this is why we could do this analysis. They have the, the, the spectra of these objects. We know basically what they're made out. They're made out of some type of a pyroxene, probably with some plagioclase component. And we know the HEDs, we know what they're made out of. We, we study them on earth. So we can, we can use that as a guide. It's not unknown what the composition is of these objects. And this is work done by uh, Rick Binzel, where he uh, measured all these small objects, reflectance spectrum uh, around Vesta. And he found that all these objects, a lot of these objects around Vesta had similar spectra to Vesta and also eucrites to HEDs. And he would map the location of these objects and he found that they were all around Vesta and some of them went towards the three to one uh, mean motion resonance. Well, the mean motion resonance is where an object would go around the sun three times, that's where the three is, and Jupiter will go around once. And in these mean motion resonance, there are less objects, there are less asteroids. So this resonance causes, because it's this interaction with Jupiter, it causes the eccentricity of these objects to increase. They start interacting with planets, getting too close to planetary orbits, and 
those the gravity of the planets changes their orbit and they either become earth crossing or they get ejected from the sun or go into the or uh, ejected from the solar system or even go into the sun but this causes these objects orbits a lot of them to become earth crossing and if they become earth crossing some of the material can land on earth and he was able to show him and shui shu <coughs> was able to show that these, that this is a way to get fragments of Vesta into an earth crossing orbit. And he was the first person because dynamically Vesta is kind of far from the resonance, but he was able to show there's all these pieces of Vesta between Vesta and the resonance. So material can travel from Vesta to a resonance and get into an earth crossing orbit. And this was the first time that he, somebody was able to show a link between an, a main belt asteroid in meteorites on Earth. And these are Dawn images. This is Rhea Silva. This is a huge impact basin at Vesta South Pole, about 505 kilometers in diameter, about 20 kilometers depth. And this huge basin is able to form the Vesta family members. If you filled out the volume of this uh, basin, there's more than enough material to form how much volume you have of all these small objects that are orbit in this inner male bell and part of the Vesta family. So this was a huge impact basin where lots of material was ejected off the surface of Vesta. And this just show there was a Rhea Silva basin and it appears to have formed on top of an older basin. And you can see all the craters on the surface. So Vesta was continually getting hit, material get ejected. But these two, the older one and Rhea Silva must have ejected lots of material off of Vesta into the inner belt. And it seems that some of that material came into an earth crossing orbit and then came to earth. In 2018, I devised equations for HEDs where you could calculate the band center and you could use it to estimate the ferrous silite and also the lacinite composition of the pyroxenes. So, and the way to use these formulas, there's one for the band center, one for the band two center, for ferrous silo and melasonite. You take those two, two compositions, the ferrous silite from band one and band two, and then you average it. And that seems to be the best estimate of the ferrous silite composition and also the melasonite. You do the same thing. You get the melasonite composition from band one, band two, take the average, and you will also get, that would be the bulk melasonite composition. For the asteroids, there's a, you can also apply these formulas to the asteroids, calculate their band centers. But the problem with the asteroids is, is because they're at lower temperature, the meteorites all measured at room temperature almost exclusively. The asteroids are at lower temperature because they're farther from the sun that you also have to estimate the surface temperature of the asteroids. And I use a rather relatively simplistic uh, temperature approximation, which seems to work pretty well but just a way to adjust it. And it's a small adjustment, but it seems to be important to try to estimate because we know the, these band positions move according to, to lower or even higher wavelengths, higher temperatures. So what we did is we calculate band centers for 217 HED spectra. These are all from ReLab. We applied these equations to the band centers. 99 of the HD spectra, we were able to estimate a bulk pyroxene composition. So this was to test how well the equations work. And we found for the ferrous silite, we could estimate plus or minus four mole percent, for lacinite, pretty much plus or minus two mole percent. Then we applied the spec, these equations to the band centers calculated for 49 bodies, 71, uh, V-type spectra of these 49 bodies, we were able to calculate the band centers for. And these were mainly from the planetary data system for, with a variety of people, but I took main belt and also Mars crossing V-types that had reflectance spectra in the database. And then we corrected it for temperatures for ready, the band center positions. This is just the band centers for the uh, HEDs. And you can see uh, on the bottom is plotted band one center, the the y-axis is band two center. You can see it's a relatively linear, not perfectly linear, but relatively linear. The Eucrites have longer band centers than the Howardites, which tend to have longer band centers than the Diogenites. 
You can see there's some overlap, but pretty much they define themselves pretty well. And also we looked at some specific type of eukrites, uh, these cumulant eukrites were formed by cumulant processes, also some more magnesium rich eukrites and some anomalous eukrites. The cumulant eukrites, because of the composition tend to kind of overlap the howardites, so do the magnesium rich eukrites. The anomalous eukrites have these anomalous action isotope uh, compositions. And this is a plot taken from Richard Greenwood. Most of the HEDs, if you plot big delta 17 versus little delta 18, they fall in a specific region of this oxygen isotope diagram. But a number of HEDs plot off. Could be due to contamination, but the ones that play way off seems to have formed on very different parent bodies than the main HED parent body, which is thought to be Vesta. We looked at, was there anything weird about the band centers for the anomalous eukrites uh, that we had in our uh, spectral database? And we didn't see any difference. So, and this is work done by Duck Middlefeld. It looks like compositionally, these anomalous eukrites are, have composition very similar to eukrites. So it appears to be evidence that different vessel-like bodies form throughout the asteroid belt with very similar composition, but slightly different oxygen isotope compositions. And this plots the predicted ferrocyolite composition for a predictable lacinite for these HEDs. And for almost all, they all fall in a straight line because you're averaging two linear equations. So of course it's gonna be linear, except for three of them, you can, the predicted compositions are physically real. Uh, for two eukrites and one diogenite, their band centers were a little off where they did, doesn't work. But for every other HED, the predicted composition is physically real. And you can see pretty well, you can define where the eukrites, howardites, and diogenites are. There is a little overlap region, but for the pretty much, our predicted compositions, you can define where a eukrite, howardite, diogenite, there's also eukrite, howardite, and howardite, diogenite in the overlap region. But it seems to work, discriminate HEDs pretty well. So the goal of all this stuff was to use the meteorites to test how well we could do it. Because for the meteorites where we know so much more, we, for the asteroids, we can't tell more than what we could tell for the meteorites. So this is used to find constraints of how well we can uh, determine pyroxene mineralogies for, uh, uh, for HEDs and then Vestoids. Here's a plot of the band one center of all the objects and band two center of HEDs, Howardites, Eukrites, and Diogenes versus the Vestoids. And these are temperature correct. And you can see pretty well they overlap a little offset. Maybe the temperature correction is not working perfectly, but it matches pretty well. There are two objects, 10537-1991-RW16 and 2168-SWOPE that fall off. 1991-RY16 is a uh, object which is known to have an alloy beam component from the spectra, so it plots anonymously. We couldn't find any good reason why SWOPE plot anonymously, so we left it in. But 1991-RY16, we took out the analysis because it definitely seems to have an alloy beam component. And you could see, for these B types, they tend to overlap the Eukrites and the Howardites. They don't really overlap the Diogenites, which we found very interesting. We'll talk more about. This just show the reflectance spectrum. You can see there's one sigma error bars. In 1991 RY16, you can see the band one center. You can see it's a little asymmetric, and that's due to an Alvin component. 2168 swope. The band two center is a little at shorter wavelengths than typical, and we're nothing really wrong with the spectrum, so we left in the analysis. So our result for, for the bodies with multiple spectra, we averaged the bulk ferrocyolite and melassonite contents. So if you had three spectra, we averaged those three to get what we figured was the average from those three spectra. So excluding 1991 RY16, find that about half of the V-types had Ferrocyan molassite contents consisted with eukrites. 33% with eukrites howardites, 13% with howardites, and 2% with howardites slash diogenite, pretty much just one object. So this is telling us is that eukrites and howardites tend to be relatively common with the vestoids, the compositions. Diogenites are extremely rare. So 
even though all three type of meteorites fall to Earth, the diogenite bestoids are almost non-existent from this data set. It's also interesting is, this is a, a plot of analysis from uh, the Dawn mission where they plotted colors from the visible and infrared mapping spectrometer, VIR, using band centers, they were able to determine uh, the composition of the surface. Red's diogenite, green's howardite, blue's eucrite. And you can see there's lots of green, lots of, um, lots of blue. There's very little red. Diogenite exposures on the surface of Vesta are really rare. And this was kind of a surprise because they thought maybe some of these impacts would expose some diogenite areas on the surface of Vesta. It wasn't the case. So this was kind of a surprise. We also plotted, well, last night we used a proxy to pyroxene composition versus distant from the sun uh, in astronomical units. And you could see uh, the velocity, there's no real trend. We didn't find any trend with the data. It just, it's, Vesta tends to plot in the middle. Some of the objects plot higher, some lower. We don't see any trend. Magnia is an object at 3.15 AU, far from Vesta, almost certainly not a fragment of Vesta. And it seems to have a composition relatively similar to the other, uh, other Vestoids. So we didn't see any trend there. We also plotted the diameter, well, diameter last night. Magni is also bigger. It's anomalous because it's far out and also because it's bigger than any other, all these other B types. And we didn't really see any trend that we could say between them, the Vesta family members and the non-Vesta family members. We didn't see any trend in composition with diameter. We also plot visual albedo. The diameter and the visual albedo are mostly from neowise except for Vesta and Magnia. And uh, this also plots Vesta. And we didn't see any trend. Vesta kind of plots in the middle, but we saw no obvious trend between albedo and uh, velasinite. That makes sense. This makes sense because the uh, average albedo for Ukraine Howard and Diogenites from uh, what they was able to find are pretty much about the same, about 30%. So what are these Vestoids telling us about Vesta? Diogenitic Vestoids are very rare. That seems obvious from the band centers and the calculate compositions. It's difficult to eject the clomerside diogenite fragment. That seems to be the result. But diogenites and howardites, and the howardites are a mixture of eucrites and diogenites, are not rare. They are found on Earth in pretty big quantities. What we find is our results consider with the modeling of Wilson and Kyle in 1996, who found that deep intrusion vessels would have meter-sized thicknesses. They uh, modeled the thicknesses of some intrusions on Vesta, and they found that the intrusion is like three meters or less. So this is consistent. This seems to, with this modeling and our result, seems to argue that there was lots of extensive intrusions on Vesta, but they were thin, they weren't thick, they weren't kilometer-ish, tens of kilometers thick uh, thicknesses, they were meter size. That makes sense. So when you had impacts on the surface, you couldn't get large fragments of just diogenite material. You would get diogenite material plus eucritic material together, but to get large fragments of just diogenite was extremely, hard to do, maybe almost impossible. So these diogenite intrusion were thin, but they had to be extensive because we find all these diogenites on Earth and we find Howardites with lots of diogenites. They had to be there, a lot of it, but they couldn't have been thick. This is a model from, um, that I saw with Brad. Brad is like the, the simplistic way of talking about Vesta. You have a eucritic crust and you would have the diogenitic layer underneath, and then you would have impacts. But then they also had a cartoon in B, which is maybe a little more complicated model. You had the eucritic crust, and then you have these diogenitic inclusions going into the crust. Usually, most people think today that the diogenites were really some type of cumulative, but then they were kind of reheated. So maybe these intrusions intruded into the uh, eucritic crust but they were thin, but they had to have been extensive. So this is the best cartoon I could find with a similar type of uh, uh, diagram of what we kind of expect. 
or what we think is happening on Vesta. So thin, extensive diagenic cruisions all on the surface. And that would explain why you don't see large diagenetic vestoids, but you would see lots of diagenite in the meteorites that we seem to fall on Earth, both the Howardites and the diagenites. And it would also explain why it seems like there are also a, a relatively big number of Howardite vestoids. They also had diagenic material. It's just that you couldn't get just huge, big chunks of just diagenite. You can do it with the eucrites, but you can't do it with the diagenites because the thicknesses of these intrusions were just too thin. So my conclusions is we're using vestoid. We found that diagenites appear to have formed on meter-sized inclusions that were extensive in Vesta's eucritic crust. It seems to me to explain all the data. And this interpretation, this analysis, you can't really do it with any other asteroid. With Vesta, we have Vesta, a large object that's intact, and we send a spacecraft to it, and we have extensive uh, spectra of it. We have meteorites on Earth, which we can pretty much almost all of them link back to Vesta. We, and these things are rather small, but we have extensive about a few thousand of these. And then we have vestoids. We have small fragments, primarily in the inner main belt, with spectra and interpreted compositions similar to Vesta. So because of all these linkages, you can do some type of analysis using the vestoids and HEDs on Vesta. But the problem is Vesta is a very rare case. You don't, we don't have any other good linkage even close to Vesta and the HEDs. And we don't, and we see Vesta family, we, we see family members of other objects, but they don't have this distinctive spectra where we can make very good mineralogical interpretation. So this is a special case, so, but we should use a special case to try to understand as much about Vesta as we can, because this is special and it, it, it's one of those things that we can do geology of Vesta. We can use it to interpret it, the data, but we need to really analyze both Vesta, the meteorites, and plus these small Vestoids, the fragments of Vesta. Uh, thank you very much, and I uh, hope you have a very nice holiday.